How can you get the Navy SEAL mindset inside of your life? In today's episode, we're going to be going over exactly what it takes to become a Navy SEAL, how to transfer that into your family's goals, as well as your business goals. Welcome to God's Business, where I interview the top Christian business owners, thought leaders, entrepreneurs, and influencers, where you can create not just a good business, but God's business, where he is the multiplier of your success. And I got to bring in a 14-year Navy SEAL, retired, built a $12 million a year business, now teaches leaderships, creates leadership teams. Him and his wife are a power couple dynamic. Now, this is with a 90% divorce rate inside of the SEAL teams. He is married still, building a business, and I think it has something to do with the fact that faith is the glue inside of their relationship and inside of their life. Welcome, my friend, Brandon Thornhill. Brandon, welcome to the God's Business Podcast. Awesome, man. I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. You got a phenomenal setup behind you. I'm like, it, your wife had to have helped with this. You it's all the wife, that. man. It's all the wife. I'm a simple I man. Love it. <laughs> and I, I would assume if I were to think of your house, like even looking at both of your guys' accounts, uh, and I'm talking Instagram for anyone who wants to go check them out, you can easily look up Brandon and then go and, and his wife is linked in his bio. And so you can look up both of them. It's like, you guys live this very like clean, organized life. I, I even showed up on the show and I was like, I knew it was th- like exactly the time we were supposed to do it. Yeah. But I was literally trying not to be rude texting the last person. I was like, I jumped on. You were already in the waiting room. I was like, oh my goodness, this guy's military. <laughs> what am I thinking? What if I was one minute late? He would have freaking left. Nah. Are you like actually yeah. kind of judgmental at people that are not on time? You know, I think it's kind of bred into you, right? Like I grew up even in high school, I was growing up with a coach that would always say Lombardi time. If you're, when you're, when you're on time, you're late when you're early, you're on time. And so it was like, always just show up 15 minutes early. But, and so I just kind of, you know, I guess adopted that throughout the military, right? It's, that's just just the culture, but you know, it's all good. (laughs) I I could see though, like you kind of learn it, but then it must be hard. Like as business has grown, have you ever been through a season where you're like overwhelmed, not able to fulfill in your obligations and And you feel like a complete jerk for doing it, like being late to things. And, you know, everybody does that, right? Especially I feel like when you're, when you get into a season of some real craziness in your business, especially when you start to have, like we had, we have 202 literally. Um, And so that throws a lot more challenges into the mix. And then you're launching multiple different businesses. And so, you know, I try as much as possible to keep my calendar as my boss, you know, Um, but you know, sometimes you do make mistakes. We're all human. And so, you know, the times that I've made, made those mistakes, you know, you just apologize and move on. But I I try not to live in the past, man. And just, it is what it is. And if you're late, you're late, but just move on. I I don't know if this is a seal thing, but I remember there was something that we incorporated in our business from hearing that Yoast our mutual, at least we think mutual connection. And, and he always talked about, you guys did like lessons learned. Like you'd like do something, you figure out like what worked, what didn't. And like, I still, to this day, like it's something that we build into our process is like, like if you make a mistake, like just figure out what to do differently and, and you write and you actually document it so that you don't make the same mistake again the next time. And that was the one thing we'd always find these mistakes, man, running all of our events. We'd be like, oh man, we should have done this different. And then we don't ever write it down. And then six months later, we run another one and we'd make the same mistake that we made before, but forget, you know, and it's like. Uh, is that, do you think that that, was that a seal practice that you guys went through? Yeah. After every mission, no matter how tired you are, like you come back and you do a quick little, you know, you, you grab your, your platoon, you get together and you, you talk about all the things that you did good. You talk about all the things that you could have improved and, um, and you just work through the whole scenario. And so that everybody knows, you know, where they could have done better in their situation and where the, the leadership could have done better in theirs. And then, you know, you fix all the problems and the challenges. And I think, you know, looking at entrepreneurs in general, looking at people in general, a lot of times we, we all are a product of our past, right? All the decisions that we made up to this point have got us to where we are. The problem is, is some people are prisoners to their past and they just live in it. They, they marinate in it. And, you know, I heard from Grant Cardone one time, which, you know, I'm a big proponent of mentorship and, and find the right people to get mentored by. And I know you like Grant, and he said, you know, you got to live in your potential, not your current results. And unfortunately, a lot of people live in their past, live in their current results, but they're not really living in the future of the potential of where they know that they can go. And so I think, you know, when you're looking at doing, you know, an after action, 
like mission, you know, conversation with, with your platoon or with who, if you're, if you're running a, a group event, like we do a lot of events. And so after every event, we'll grab the head shed, we'll grab all the leadership together and we'll say, Hey, what do we do? Good. What do we, what do, we do bad? You know, what are the things we could have improved on? And, um, and it just makes you better every single event that you're going to do. But, but if you just keep making this, the same mistakes over and over again, you know, then it's, it's like, what are we doing here? You know, it's. <laughs> yeah. And what's to, the interesting thing you said is like, no matter how tired you are, I think there's like an emphasis on that, that you start forgetting some of the stuff afterwards. So yeah. no matter how tired you are was number one, but number two, the after action that you do. And, and I, I, I'm just interested in this. What's the way that you actually do the implementation? So like, you may be like, Hey, this didn't work out that well. What should we do better? And sometimes you don't know the answer to that. Or even if you do, how do you then draw out the implementation plan? And, and how are you doing that inside of business as well? You typically, you, the, you know, you, you come up with a solution right there. It's like, Hey, this is what we did. This is what we could have done better. Next time we need to make sure we're doing this, you know, no matter what the scenario is. And so, mm. you know, a lot of times when people after a long mission, it could be a long, long, long mission, right? The first thing you want to do is you want to come back, take a shower, take care of yourself, get comfortable, especially if you've been cold, wet, tired, and miserable for the past hours or a few days. Right. And so in business, it's really no different. If you're running a big event, and, you know, you have all these different people that you got to cater to, you know, running events is exhausting, dude. Like you're, you're tired. And especially yeah. for, for someone like me, who's a little bit more introverted, you know, like I, I don't gain energy from being around a lot of the people that more sucks the energy out of me because it's a transfer of energy. And so after the events, man, I'm exhausted. I just want to leave, go get food and, and bounce. But there's no, like, that is the number one time to sit down with your leaders and say, Hey guys, or girls, like, this is what this is what we can do better. And, and we need to make sure we're, we're implementing these things in the next event so that we can, you know, have a better event for everybody that's here. Right. Or whatever it is, whether it's business or whether it's, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And, and you, you and your wife both together have done some pretty crazy things. Like I said, if you go check you out on Instagram, I think it's the easiest way to kind of see and showcase. Not everyone is super open on Instagram yet. It showcases a lot of what you guys do. Talk about the events that you run break down you and your wife and, and the dynamic of how you guys work and the businesses yeah. and things that you guys have your hands in. Yeah. So my Instagram's at the Brandon Thornhill and it's only at the Brandon Thornhill because somebody else took Brandon Thornhill. So I had to find something. Uh, so but don't my wife follow the Brandon Thornhill guy, make sure it's the Brandon, the Thornhill. Brandon Thornhill. And you'll, you'll see. Yeah. You'll see it on there. But my wife's is Julia M Thornhill. Um, but yeah, we, you know, our story guys, we, you know, I grew up in a small town in Ohio, joined the Navy when I was 19 years old. Um, you know, went and became a corpsman for a couple of years, which is, which is just a medic in the military. And, um, and then it's a, it was a pretty interesting scenario actually, dude, because like I went in to be a seal and that was like, that was everything I wanted to do. I played sports growing up, all this stuff was very competitive, but like, as I was, you know, going into qualified to be a seal, the recruiter lied to me. He said, I was good to go. Like your eyesight's good. Your ASVAB's good. And it wasn't, I was actually. I was an ASVAB waiver, <laughs> believe it or not. And so, you know, I was, I would, I would go to practice. I remember my mom, we, I lived like 35, 40 minutes away from my high school. She worked at Honda transmissions on the factory line, but they had access to a pool. And so I would literally go to the pool every morning. I'd wake up at 5.00 AM. I'd be there by like 5.30, 5.45. I'd swim. I taught myself how to do the side stroke that they, they said you had to do. And I'd go ask the lifeguards, like, I have no idea what that is. But I went and looked up videos, taught myself how to do it and trained myself in the morning before school started. And then when, right before school, because I'd get there probably around 7, 7.15-ish, school would start around 7.30. I would just shoot basketball until school started. So I did this over and over and over from like my sophomore year until like my senior year. And then finally, I got a chance to go in. And when I finally got in, imagine that, showing up to boot camp, they're like, you don't qualify. I was like, are you kidding me? I was lied to this whole time. And so, so, so break down, break down to people why you didn't qualify. Cause I, I, so there's an ASVAB you have to take, and there's a certain percentage of the scores that you have to, um, I guess, add up. And if they don't add up, then you don't qualify for that program. So you have to pick a different job. And so my recruiter is like, yeah, you're good to go. And my eyesight wasn't good. And I've had, I had like, um, I don't know, 2100 or 2300 and you had to have like 2070 or 2040 be like the max. 
And, you know, all this stuff, I guess I should have done a little bit better job of doing some due diligence on, but why, I was why did you, why did you want to be a seal though? Like that doesn't, you know, there's, there's always these like reasons to yeah. like, what you just want to be cool. Like there's just no, no one makes it through and becomes a seal for wanting to be cool or no, you're right. whatever. Right. They, they even talk about like, there's a lot of fit people that are like, yeah, they could, their, their fitness is there. I'm looking up a friend of mine right now. It's Brent Lloyd. I don't know if you know him. I know Brent uh, really well. He's one of my close friends. Cool. So yeah. I know Brent forever. We lifted like way back in the day and, and he's come to a lot of our events and everything. But Brent, like he's like the smallest like seal like ever probably. I think, I think yes. he actually was, but he had terrible eyesight. He had to get like LASIK and like, or do I think he had to get a worse version where they like scrape your eyeballs or whatever. Terrible. And like, he was always a joke. I think Yost was his instructor. So he's like, everyone's like, bro, this guy's not, not going to be a seal. All the fit guys, they're quitting. And this guy's like 110 yeah. pounds. And, and it was just crazy. So like, why did you want to become a seal? What was the thing that triggered you that made you go, this is what I want to do. And then what was the thing that was that actually good enough to bring you through? Or did you have to find a new motivation? Those are great questions. You know, it's funny. I know Brent really well. Um, and Brent was a few classes behind me. And I think I had just made it through Hell Week, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm remembering right, when I met him. And I was like, oh, man, this guy's tiny. Like, I don't know if he's going to make it. And, and then he makes it through, right? Like, and then Brent's Brent. He's, he's, he's an awesome dude. Um, but, you know, that's a, I think that's a story. I'll, don't worry, I'll answer your question. I think that's a story because I was also a first phase buzz instructor. So I got to see both sides. I got to see the side of going through it and I got to see the side of what the instructors get to see and really, you know, who is really going to make it through the program and nobody ever really knows. Right. But what I will say is I'll, there, there's a, there's, there's a, like this time that kind of sticks in my head where we were going through hell week and there was this, this officer and this guy was like, you know, I don't want to say a typical egotistical officer, but somewhat, right. Like he was all about himself. Um, and he was a strong performer. And guys looked up to him, but he was also really like super fleet military, like followed the rules, everything. So some guys really liked him. Some guys didn't. And I was one of those guys that was a little bit skeptical of him, but man, he was a, he was a really good performer and I'll never forget it. We were in hell week. I think it was like day two. We were down, like they call it the elephant flats, which is like, you know, or the, uh, or elephant cages, which is way down South by, uh, uh, Imperial beach. And I haven't been, I forget all the terminology now, but, um, it's crazy. So, so he's this guy, we're, we're all running with boats on our heads and we had to, just to get to chow, you had to like, you know, earn your way to eat and you had to race. Everything's a race. And I remember like, we're racing, we're pushing, we're going really hard. And I see this guy step out from under, underneath his boat and he's walking back crying, bawling his eyes out. And it's this officer who was so cool. Like that one of the, one of the top performers, but he also treated people, you know, some of the enlisted guys, like, in my opinion, wrong. And so I just remember thinking, wow, if this guy quit and I'm still here, I got this. Like, I'm, I didn't know, like, this guy, this guy who, you know, everybody looked up to, who everybody thought was strong, who was a strong performer, he's out. Like, this clearly isn't a performance game necessarily. It is a little bit, but it's a lot more mentality. And so, you know, that was one thing that solidified me was just knowing, like, if, if he's out, then I can definitely make it through this program because, you know, yeah, it, it, it just, it just shows you how some people are just a lot weaker than what they portray. Um, and so anyways, going backwards, um, you said, why, why did I want to be a SEAL? There it's funny. There was a, a video called SOCOM or a, a PlayStation video called SOCOM back in the day. And there was like a 30 minute teaser video on there that I got to see one of my, I walked into one of my friend's houses. He, he was playing that game. And then, but there was that video that we watched and, and right before he, cause he was going to skip through it. I said, hold on, I want to check this out. And I watched the whole video. Cause I wanted to be a Marine before that, you know, I just heard all the hard, how hard it was, the crucible, all this stuff. And then I found this Navy SEAL thing where they talked about hell week. And I was like, Oh, that's, that sounds crazy. <laughs> that sounds very challenging. Like, uh, I want I want to, I want to learn more about that. And so that was really piqued my interest to where I started diving more into it and started really, you know, figuring out the challenge, like, like that's the toughest military training in the world. Like, can I actually make it through that? And then, you know, from there I started looking at the missions that they were doing and started. So did you have like that. a pretty good family then? Like your family was fine. You weren't like, like no, it, it, no. just, yeah, yeah, dude. I don't know. I grew up like, 
my, my, my mom and dad got divorced when I was in the first, like first grade and my mom raised me, you know, but she was a single mom working hard. You know, she worked at Honda transmissions, um, on the factory line, which, which, which was working for Honda. And, you know, she would usually work from like 3 PM to like 1 AM. So I really got raised by either my brother or a babysitter and sports is what kept me, I think, um, in the right, you know, mentality, but it was all about just competition. Right. I mean, I think growing up when we grew up, you grew up watching movies like Rambo and, you know, kickboxer and all these movies that, that, that like glorified competition, you know, glorified winning in life. And, um, and, you know, and it's sometimes winning isn't easy, right? It's the majority of times there's going to be a lot of challenges that's going to come along your journey. And I figured, Hey, if I can make it through this, like I can make it through anything in life. And so that was one of the things that really got me excited to go through the program. So you had said that you're like, Oh, I want to, I want to go see, this seems like one of the hardest things ever. I remember there was a video, I think it's Dan Bilzerian, the, the guy who owns like, I don't know, whatever is like CBD company is or whatever. But people probably know, right? And and most people that are listening to this probably hate the guy. But that guy as well, I think at at some point he went through some like junk because he's like, I want to see this is the hardest thing ever. And he was saying he basically made it to be a SEAL, but isn't like, is that, you know, that guy, like, is that guy yeah. a SEAL? No, he's not. I don't know a lot about him. So I don't have, I, you know, I don't want to comment too much. But what I have heard through through, you know, the teams is that he had some personality issues in third phase. So the way it's structured is you go through in doc, which is, I don't know how many weeks it is now, but when I went through, it was like five weeks. And and then you go into first phase. First phase is more of the crucible and doc gets you ready for first phase. First phase, like it's relentless. You know, you're, the instructors are trying to put you through a curriculum that is, you know, testing every limit that you have to see if you can actually handle it. And, you know, like when I was an instructor, I'll give you an example. There was times when we would, um, during hell week, we would have guys who were coughing up blood and we would come, we'd pull them out. If they, if they, if they started slowing down their broker, we'd pull them out, put them on a pulse ox. If they're like sat in at like 78%, 80%, we would then take them, put them on O2 and get them back up to where they need to be. And if they can sustain it, we'll put them back in the class. If they can sustain it and keep performing, then we keep them in the class, even though they're coughing up blood. If they can't, then of course we keep pulling them, making sure it's safe. It's a lot safer environment than what it might sound like, but it is, it is pretty safe. Um, the medical staff's incredible. However, like that's what we're talking about. You have to, you can't just survive the program. You actually have to perform in the, in the program. And so, you know, the, the, the belief that you could just have to survive, that was something that was really surprising to me is I saw guys getting pulled out when I was going through the program who were surviving, but not performing. They were holding their mm. boat in their back. And so I was like, oh man, all the books said I just need to survive this thing. I actually have to perform. Like you got to perform to a high standard. And so, um, you know, for him, I think it was a personality conflict, maybe of, you know, personal things that he was doing wrong, putting himself before the team and, you know, some other things. Like I said, I don't want to, I don't want to put anything out there that I'm not a hundred percent sure on, but the things I heard wasn't very good. And would have gotten him dropped from the program very easily. Some some if weapons. You look at the, oh, go ahead. Some, we, there's some weapons. Some weapon safety issues as well, from what I heard. Yeah, and 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 now he's kind of, kind of like cleared it up. It's like basically I was, but I wasn't, or I or I made it through it, or something. And, you can't but be, that's a big piece of it, right? Basically, you can't be basically a seal. You can't be basically successful as an entrepreneur. You can't be basically. It's like you either are or you aren't. Like. I went through seal. Let me give you an example. That's just ego, by the way. I went through seal. So, so once you get into the to seal teams, what's the next ridge line? Seal team six, right? And so I went to go into seal team six. I did went to the selection process, did that whole thing, and um, I made it through. The hardest part of it is the first seven weeks. It's the hostage rescue portion. If you make through that, you have a high chance that you're going to make through the program. However, I did make a lot of mistakes during that during that portion. Um. But I, but they kept me and I stayed and then you go external for a couple of weeks. They take you away from, from, from doing all the, um, you know, different CQB and all that. And then they bring you back in to see how you're going to perform. And I made a couple more mistakes right before we're about to go do, do jumping and, and I got dropped rightfully. So I was devastated then, but sometimes the best thing that happens to you are the things that don't happen for you. 
<laughs> and so mm. it's like I learned that from The Rock, actually, when he didn't make it to the NFL. That spoke to me back during that time when I was going through a very challenging time of when I was like, why did I not make it through the program? Like, you know, but I not I don't walk around saying I basically made it in the SEAL Team 6. No, dude, I didn't make it through the program. And here this guy is saying I basically was a SEAL. No, you weren't, bro. Like, you weren't. <laughs> you made it through Hell Week. You made it through the dive portion. You got to third phase. But that does not mean that you were basically a SEAL. You still got to go through a lot of training. Come on, man. <laughs> when you look at the world now, how it's different, you talk about you were all excited about like Rocky and competition. A lot of that's been taken out of, of the yeah. culture now in America. Obviously, even military stuff. I'm not a military guy. Like I, I don't, you know, I'm not a military guy. Even when I would train the guys and we bring guys, we did, we actually did a activity where we had two SEALs two uh, medics and were on on the beach in coronado during hell week so they were out there like doing their actual thing we had like a group of 30 guys and i didn't i didn't yell at anyone everyone expect me to yell at it i'm like bro i'm not doing nothing i'm not gonna act there's a lot of men's programs out there that literally act like yeah. they are this thing and i'm like bro i'm not about it so i'm putting that out there first off is even that i made actual seals come out and put the guys through it because i'm like I'm not going to sit here and yell with camo yeah. pants on and act yeah. like I'm a Navy SEAL because that would just freak me out. So my question is, if you look at and maybe even comment on all the men's things that are acting like Navy SEALs afterwards, but when when you look at the the way it's soft, I've heard the military's even like become very this progressive, like basically just in their in a bubble listening to all these people that are probably mentally insane. And, and it has become softer. Do you feel like this, the process to become a SEAL, the whole thing has become soft? Do you think it's easier? Do you think it's maintaining the standard that it once did? And, and, and then maybe, you know, maybe don't have to comment on the military at whole, but, but just that in general, that, that piece of it, do you feel like it's what it once was? You know, first off, I got a lot of respect that, that you did that the way that you did. Cause I've seen other guys run masterminds where they have these civilians running around yelling at people. And I'm like, Really? Like what qualifies this person to be doing anyway? So like, I got a lot of respect for that. Um, the second thing, yeah, I don't really have a lot of, like I got out in 2018. I was a instructor from 2015, to 2018. So I saw quite a, quite a few different classes, right? I got to see, I think like 15 or 16 different classes go, go through the pipeline. Um, the conversations I've had with some of my, some of my friends that are still in has been very surprising to say the least of like where the military is headed as a whole. Um, it's 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 really sad to see the politics, how politics control the military and politicians especially control the military. Um, you know, like I got I got to tread lightly. But when you like it's cool to have girls come through the program, I have no issues with girls coming to the program. Right. Oh. However, however, when they when they started doing that, they felt like they had to do certain things with the program to make sure that the standard was good, right? To where there wasn't going to be somebody that was snuck in, uh, whether a guy or a girl. And I think that was actually really smart. When they did do that, they had to look through all the curriculum and they had to make sure that it was solid um, to where, you know, it's there's no instructor creep going on. There's no because because one class might be a little bit harder than another class. You know, if, if one class is performing at extremely high level because everybody's just rock stars and then you have another class that isn't as high, well, now you can see how the standard's not the same. So they came in and did a really good job, I think, of like professionalizing and protecting the standard. Um, now, of course, everything's always headshot dependent, right? So like that's where things always get a little bit different. And I don't want to talk too much on it because it's just not my place to. But what I did see is, you know, if, if there's good leadership who is willing to protect that standard, then it's great. If there's leadership that has their own, you know, politics in mind of, of things that, you know, their ideas of, of what might, you know, move them, I guess, a little bit more forward in their career, then it might look a little bit different. You know what I mean? That is interesting because you have to always protect incentive. They say compensation drives behavior. And so if you're, if the way up is, you know, you have to protect that in everything you do. If the way up is I need to look good to these people, then sometimes you sacrifice whatever's best to look good or 
and not saying that anyone ever does, but just in general, that is a rule of thumb. You even say it's sometimes it's harder the classes. I think that's smart for people to think about. I know that there's some classes where it's cold, like there's some classes where it's hot. And so it's like completely different experiences and, yeah. and some can be like really crazy. I know David Goggins. I don't know if you've studied any of his stuff. You like his stuff? Yeah, David's a savage, man. I mean, there's no doubt. The guy is a savage. Yeah. When you look at what but he, he's, he said, there was good. times where he, he went through like three times or something, right? Because he had yeah. injuries and problems. And and so it was his, I think you can only try three times or something. I don't, I don't know at all. But I do know that that was his last chance to be able to try. And he had times where certain ones, because he went through three, he's like, oh, this one was cr- really, really hard, very cold, bad weather, bad instructors. Right, like you know, or hardcore. We know that the instructors, you're not a jerk on here, but like part of the play is like there's people that are very hard on people and very maybe nicer. And I know that there's a there's a piece of that, but there's times where you get hard people that are like, you know, really trying to get you all to quit. Right, that's that's their job is to see if you can make it through. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't the nicest instructor, but you know, it's there were guys who were super motivating, and 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 we everybody played their role right, so it was it worked out really well. Yeah, David. I mean, I don't know David. I never met him personally, so I don't really have a huge opinion on him. I just, the only interaction I've ever had with him was when I was going through the program, going through SQT, he walked in and I think at that point he was, he was kind of like doing the, the seal swick motivator thing. Um, and, and I think he was kind of doing, starting to do his ultras or whatever, but you know, mixed opinions from the teams, but you know, that's the thing is you never, I don't ever take anybody's opinions from, from about anybody. I like to, meet them myself and, 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 you know, experience them myself, because sometimes, as you know, you know, somebody sees somebody, they have an interaction with somebody and they don't like them because they're projecting their own insecurities onto them. And so I don't want to ever say that I like somebody or dislike them when I've barely ever met them, because especially just listening to other people's opinions, because who knows if it's true or false. Dude. And and talk about like, look at how many people this dude's reach and not, you know, it's not like he's like super, I'm trying to make tons of money off you guys type thing. And, and, yeah. and time has shown that, but just the reach people get upset about that too. Like people succeeding is also not a very yeah. fun thing. The thing about averages is you talk about, we talk about average people and maybe I would love for you to even touch on this average people. Just there always is an average, right? As a seal, there's the average seal as well. It's just better, more hardcore than the average person. But like, you know, even in a, in, if you took all the seals ever to exist, there would be the, the low end of the spectrum, the mid section, and then the top performers, Absolutely. because there's always an average in every single environment. And so when you have someone like, like him who in a successful side influence dreams, accomplishment outside of military, especially because obviously there's, phenomenally pe- people that have done a lot more that I think even David would say yeah, they've done more military than I did bro it's like talk about impressive dude like and and their seals are still people you know and yeah. so it to look at success it's tough to see people freaking go from you know seal maybe you thought man I'm way better than this guy I deployed way more than this guy and then boom he blows up and he's got like millions and millions of followers selling tons of books probably looks like he gets to just run for a living you know like life after the military is is it difficult you feel like life after the military i know that seal is a big identity bro you guys earn the identity right like like life after the military what's the common thing that people usually do after man it's so different i've seen people do so many different things you know everybody comes from so many different walks of life i think everybody wants to keep they want to keep achieving in some some sort of level because most team guys are achievers yeah. um and the guys who don't i think you know sometimes they struggle um but going back to your to your david goggins comment with um with sometimes people you know might look at him or look at anybody who's having success cuz i've even had some some people do it to me and you know they're like when once you start to get known, best known beats best talented. That's what Grant Cardone talks about, right? Best known beats yeah. best talent. It doesn't matter. And and I've seen that happen. And and there's so many guys who were ten times, one hundred times the operator that I was. Like literally, some of these operators that are operating at the highest level, they're unbelievable, dude. Like unreal operational capabilities. 
um, and knowledge, skill, leadership capabilities, you'll never know them. You'll never know them because they'll either retire, they'll stay in that realm or they'll retire and they'll go into some other realm like private equity and they'll crush it in something else, but they'll never be on social media. And that's fine. But the point is, is sometimes people see somebody with a title, a SEAL, SWIC, you know, EOD, SF, whatever on social media. And they think that automatically that that should bring massive credibility. But like you're saying, there are some guys that I even know on social media that people probably shouldn't be following. And you're like, uh, this dude got, he's, he wasn't a good team guy. Um, and so you're just following him because of that. Then that's probably not the best idea to do it. Like you need to find, you, you should probably audit who you're following a little bit. Um, but I, I don't, I know I didn't answer your question. What was your, what was the question? Cause I went, no, you're, of, you're great, bro. You're doing, you're doing awesome. And I, I'm thinking about after the seals, you think about like, that's a big chunk of your life. How long, how long were you in? Cause you look years. super young. So it's like, so it's yeah, I was you know, in, it always fourteen years. Yeah. Yeah. Fourteen I was years. Tw- twelve and, and, twelve years in the teams, two years as a corner. Yeah, and then and that and you said two thousand eighteen is when you got out, right? Yeah. So twenty eighteen and and looking at the identity piece, how difficult was that? Because I know from uh on Yost's side, you know, everywhere he goes, everyone wants to like be a Navy SEAL in something, right? So we he had a CrossFit gym in his backyard for a long time. And so we would work out every day for three and a half years together. And, and Pete, no matter what, if he's injured, cause he had old injuries, he had plenty of them, you know, and he's like 40 something now. And so it's like, there's always someone who, if you challenge a seal in anything, you have this identity as a seal forever, but also an expectation. And the thing is, is like, if someone challenges you in a push-up competition, let's say, which is very stupid, but let's say they do, you have only everything to lose and they have everything to gain. Because if they lose to a push-up competition to you, they're, you're a SEAL, so you should. If you lose to them, well, then it's like they got they got this big deal, right? So was it a tough identity shift becoming Brandon again? And who is Brandon? And who is that guy outside of just being this identity that's very well earned? But at some point, like, you're no longer this guy who can, you know, physical capabilities that won't always be there. And, and if your identity is yeah. in that or you're not deploying anymore, like, so you can really lose yourself because you're no longer like that guy. How How is that process? That's a great question. I'd say a lot of, for me, I'll give you my background because when I was a first phase bud instructor, I started, I got into, into direct sales. And as you know, direct sales is very it's basically a personal development program with a compensation plan attached to it, right? So like if you're yeah. not growing, your income's not going to grow. You're not going to be a person of influence that other people want to follow. And so I really had to grow me. Like, for example, I had never really worked with women. And so like I had to really learn how to communicate effectively. And I, I like how to influence friends and influence people became like my Bible. You know, like I was studying that thing over and over and over trying to learn, okay, what am I doing wrong? Because clearly. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm being maybe a little bit too aggressive. So anyways, we, I got involved in the industry, found some really, really solid mentors and I started growing and I made life all about growth, like 100%. If it wasn't growing, I cut it off. Um, and, 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 and I did that because I know that when you grow, everything grows. Like Jim Rohn says, success isn't something you can go chase. It's something you attract by the person you become in the process. And so I need to become a newer version of me and I wanted to have a breakthrough in my life. And I didn't have the self-confidence that I, that I wanted to have because of past failures or whatever. And so I needed to break the current image of myself by going super deep internal and making it more about, you know, living in my potential versus my current results. And, and I was going to masterminds like crazy, spending mo- all the money I was making. Obviously, I was paying down some of the debt because I was almost $40,000 in credit card debt, 18% interest when I got into direct sales. I was able to pay that all off in a year. Um, through, and that, that was just from what, like being, being like as dumb with your money. Yeah. Just through the direct sales industry, all the money we're making, I was putting back into the, into the debt. No, like before, awesome. like you're 40 K in debt because like you were just like, what done with your money or like, what was the, like, uh, we were $40,000 in debt because I didn't have a money mindset because I grew up in a, you know, I, I grew up without anybody teaching me how to, how to, how to make money, keep it, grow it, invest it, multiply it, all that. Right. And so 
when we lived in Europe, because we were stationed in Europe for two years, wow. we traveled, man. We did everything. We went, we were constantly going, but we spent money. <laughs> but but <laughs> you know, but, you know Let's go. this is the cool thing about it though. Like I believe it happened for a reason, man. It really put me in a mindset of abundance of knowing that if other people can have this lifestyle, why can't I? Yep. You know, I was just in the military. I was in a very slow vehicle. I love the military. It's a guaranteed paycheck, but it's also guaranteed not to make much money. And so I needed to figure out, okay, I remember my, it was, it was the anniversary of me and my wife where I was, I was driving down to Lake Como with her. And I remember saying, babe, one day we're going to figure out how we can just have a life. To me, I'm not money motivated. I'm lifestyle driven. And I said, I want to be able to have time, money, do what I want with who I want, have fun, enjoy life. And like when we have our kids one day, we can go you know, to Europe whenever we want and have to worry about a boss. I have to worry about showing up to work. I have to worry about being a slave to the traditional things of society. And so I remember saying, one day we're going to figure this thing out. And I don't know how, I don't know what's going to happen, but one day we're going to figure this thing out. And that was it. It was just a, a seed that was planted. <clears throat> and then crazy enough, man, crazy enough, you know. I believe that that once you become the person that you need to become, like abundance truly flows in. You don't have to work as hard for money anymore. Like I truly believe that because over time, like I got introduced to the direct sales industry and I worked hard. I worked really hard, um, but I also worked just as hard on myself as I did on my business. And so as we started to grow us, our marriage grew, our finances grew, our relationships grew, everything grew, our, our influence grew. And then, you know, now man, I can, I can tell you, I live a life that I never thought was possible. Like back then, like it's a complete shift in paradigm. And I have things coming to me that I don't even have to work for. It's just flowing in through multiple different sources. And uh, it's pretty impressive, man, to, to see where we were then, where we are now, and kind of how that all rolled out. And you guys being married before all of this as well, how was that transition? Because you look at one, SEALs have a 90% divorce rate. No offense, just it's just statistics, yeah. and and so you're the ten percent. So congrats, and and so inside of that, you guys are married in military, uh, meaning like you're in the military, and then and then all this rapid growth curve that can sometimes like like grow people apart, right? Like you become a new person. You're probably very different than who you were when you were forty k in debt in teams yeah. to now who you are. How did you guys grow that together? What did that look like to make sure that you guys were on the same page? You became this new human being and she probably did as well. And you guys somehow did that together and still loved each other for these new people that you became. It's a great story. Um, to understand it fully, you got to kind of understand where we came from. So like, you know, my wife, she's amazing, dude. Like she, so she, she grew up broken, broken home. Um, joined the military when she was like 19, went to, went to Iraq with the army. And, um, she has a crazy story, man. Like I keep telling her, she needs to publish a book about it, but like she was in Iraq and, and it was literally, you know, the military is great and I don't want to bash the military, but, but as you can see with even like, you know, the Gallagher scenario, like the, the leadership, sometimes they do things that are against the law but they know that they can bend the law because it's the military and they can do whatever they want. Right. Technically a lot of times until they get caught. And so obviously in his scenario, he was innocent, but with my wife, she was, it was Julia Narvaez against the United States army and she won. And, and they, they did every, they threw everything at her, everything wow. to try to get her in trouble. And it's a long story, but she, they, they would even give her a lawyer in Iraq to, to, um, you know, to represent her, she had to represent herself. And she, not only did she represent herself properly, but she came in, caught all the leadership in a lie right in front of the judge and got them, got it all thrown out of court. And then she wow. was good. And it, and it, the story is so much better than that, but I keep telling her she needs to write a book. Um, so she's a strong willed woman, right? Like, like she's, um, she's amazing. So I met her, she was a bartender in, in, in Norfolk, Virginia. And I was out there, I was at team two and I was out with one of my buddies and on a Sunday night of all, of all times. Right. And, um, we just met, man, we hit it off the first conversation. It was funny. The first thing I told her, as I said, Hey, I'm going to go, I'm going to go skydiving next week. I'd love for you to come. And she didn't come, you know? And, and, um, you know, I, I, I remember messaging her saying, Hey, you missed such a good day. Like, you know, I, 
I was basically just letting her know that she was, you know, missing out on a great time. And she's like, Hey, I'll go next time. I was like, yeah, right. Whatever. And so anyways, we, we book another time and then she, she does, she comes out the next time we go skydiving. That was our first date. And, uh, it was amazing. And second day we went rock climbing. That was when I knew I was like, all right, I got, I got a pretty awesome girl here. So like, I'm going to, I'm going to keep this one. And then we were married within four months, four months. I knew wow. locked it in and we were good. And, but you say, you know, 90% divorce rate and dude, it wasn't easy. I mean, being in the military, being gone, you know, two, 300 days out of the year. Um, there was a lot of ups, a lot of downs, but one thing about her is she never quits. And, you know, and same thing for wow. obviously me, like we've just never quit on each other. And as we started to grow into new versions of us, we always made it a point to make sure that we're going to all these masterminds, as many of them as possible together. We're doing marriage retreats. We used to do at least two a year. Right now we have, you know, the two under two. So we're doing at least one a year. Um, but we're, but we'll listen to personal development in the morning. We'll read the Bible together. You know, like we do all these things so that we continue to grow together. Yeah. I bet deploying was tough. Like I know that it's not like military's separate. So it's not like chicks are on a different boat. So I'm sure there's times where she had to go places and you weren't there. And so she's with all these guys. You guys, I'm assuming you're around girls or at least some of them are. I don't know. No, we, Again, we, I wasn't we, weren't, around, we weren't around any girls, man. Like we're, <laughs> we were out in an outstation, like in the middle of like literally a small town in Afghanistan, a small little village. So and, she didn't uh, have, she didn't have to worry about you then. She was just like, Oh, guys. cool. You're not around no girls, all but, guys. but I'm assuming she was around guys, right? Like, so that's like a weird thing to be separated. And she's having to work with all these dudes all the time. And you're like, yeah. not there. That's tough. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and the challenge was, is when we got married, <laughs> being young and dumb, we went out, we went to Bora Bora for our honeymoon and it put us like $14,000 in credit card debt. And I remember going on, going to, on deployment and I'm like, this is perfect. You know, we're going to deployment. I'll pay down all my debt. And it didn't like, because obviously see, she's still spending money. She's working and I wanted to pull her out of that, that environment. Right. And so I got her out of the environment while I was on deployment to where she wasn't working as a bartender, but she wasn't bringing in as much money. And so there was a lot of stress on, on us financially. But I remember just thinking, you know what, it's going to happen. Like, whatever, I'll figure it out somehow when I get back. We'll, we'll... And the crazy thing is, man, is this is what I'm saying. When you, when you truly, like most people, when they pray, they pray just to pray, right? They're just praying, just asking for something, but they don't really have expectations around it. Like when I pray, like I'm asking with, with, with expectations, I'm asking, knowing that it's going to happen. Like, like yeah. one of my mentors, Bob Proctor, he used to have a saying, you know, it's, I'm so happy and grateful now that like, that's what you tell yourself every day. And when I ask God for things, like, I'm not just asking for little things. Like I'm asking him with expectations to know that it's going to happen. Not from a, you know, like a, a standpoint of um, not being appreciative and having gratitude, but from just a standpoint that I know he's going to deliver and have having faith and faith is the ability to see in the, to, to believe in the invisible. Right. And so long story short, as I knew somehow he was going to deliver crazy thing is I get back from deployment. One week I get back, I get a call from a friend. Hey, there's a, uh, there's, there's this extreme seal experience. Don Shipley, who's putting on a course. It's two weeks long. He needs an instructor. Will you come be an instructor with me? The pay is amazing. Like literally I did three of those different scenarios over a matter of a couple months, got creative, figured out how I do it around work, paid off all my debt within, you know, like a month and a half, two month period. <laughs> <laughs> that is so crazy. It's so wild, man. And it's weird to think about how constricting hindsight, how things lo look so easy. You're like, oh, 40K in debt. It's like, well, with now what, what you do, you know, you'd be happy to have only $40,000 charged on your credit card to pay off in expenses every month. Be like, oh, that's great. And But at the time, it's like 40K in debt. How are we ever going to get out of that? And then it's like, well, you did and you didn't die. And you got to have experiences, not saying that anyone should go in debt for experiences ever, but it's like, wow, you, a lot of the things that we think are going to kill us are, are not, I don't want to go too deep into this, but I just know that uh, one thing that I thought was a very, very cool that I've heard from like just seal experiences. And I'd love to hear from your side is most people don't quit doing meaning like when during, during uh, hell week or something. Most people that quit, quit at the thought of what's to come next. 
they usually don't quit if they are in the actual experience. And it was like this whole thing around like a lot of times our mind, I think it, uh, one of the examples was there was a, there was one time and I'll butcher it, but like imagine hell week and they're throwing you guys in the water over and over again. And basically they were like, all right, back in the water. And a guy quit. And then they said, we're not going in the water. And so he quit at the thought of going back in the water. And then they didn't actually even go back. And yeah. so it was like, bro, you just quit. And like, you know, at, at what's to come, not what you're in. Yeah. yeah. Like, is, is that pretty true? hundred percent. Yeah. It's, it's the end. Uh, we always used to say it like anticipation is, is way worse than actually doing it. Like, the thought of having to get back in the water, the thought of having to do a second dive of the day, you know, cause we used to, in, in second phase, you do two, four hour dives, right? Like during, during dive week or whatever. Um, and then, yeah. And during hell week, like you, it, you got to make it from evolution to evolution. It's like Dean Carnaz has ran like 350 miles and he was running from telephone to telephone to telephone pole. Like it wasn't, he wasn't thinking about the end of the race. He was just saying, I just need to make it to that next telephone pole. And so if you can break things up into chunks, it's a lot more. Bro, it's so hard to do that though. Like, could you imagine running 350 miles from telephone pole to telephone pole while you're in it? You're like, how many telephones have I gone through? How far <laughs> am I in? How, how much longer do I have? Left? Yeah. Like, it's not yeah. like it's that easy to be present in doing without yeah. worrying about the future or thinking about like how far behind you are. Like, it ain't yeah. easy, bro. Like, even stuff like that. If someone were to go out right now and say, I'm going to run 10 miles from telephone pole to telephone pole, bro, the second you get like 0.3 miles in, if you're not a runner, you're going to be like, how far have I gone? How much further do I have to go? There's no way I'm going to make that. So it's not as easy as saying it, but it, the truth is still the truth, which is if you can make it to the next telephone pole, which everyone can, everyone in the world that can walk can go 10 miles. Like as long yeah. as you're physically able, like everyone, that's why you guys run so dang much is because you can always keep running, right? It's not like it's a 225 pound squat. Like you can always keep running and, and everyone can do it if they actually want to. And if they can but be present like that. Yeah. I think it's just the ability to quiet that storm that's going on in your head and just focus back on where you need to be at. Right. Like if you're only focused on the fact that, you know, you can't do this and that, you know, how many, how many pulls have I already ran? Well, none of that stuff matters. That's in the past. And this is what I keep talking about. Like you got to live in wow. when you're going in your business, there's going to be times when there's massive amounts of storms that are happening and you think it's all going to crumble and you want to just tear it down. And, but that's life. That's the same thing as marriage. Marriage is extremely challenging. There's going to be times when you're like, I, I'm done. I want, I want out of this thing, but that's not an answer. You know, the, the answer is, is to know where you, where you need to be living in the potential of where that relationship can be living in the potential of where your business can one day be and, um, and focusing on that. And that is what's going to drive you and pull you. It's like, you know, if you focus on God, like for, for all of our faithful friends here, you know, everything else kind of makes it easier because your focus is off of you and it's on something yeah. else. It's on a higher being. You know what I mean? And what what was that experience like for you? When did you have your first encounter with God? And how does that, obviously, I want to get into how that is incorporated in what you guys do. And and my very first question to you is, I was like, what do you tell, tell everyone what you do? And you're like, we've been, we've been getting there. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. what was your faith journey discovery? Like I didn't grow up in a church. I, I my family did weren't the ones who like introduced me to it. How did you grow up or, or was this something that you found later? Yeah. Great questions. No, I didn't grow up in a church at all. Uh, my, my wife, her dad was a pastor, so she grew up in it, right? Like this was her cool. life. Like Similar. She my, wife, my wife's dad's like ordained, like, like went to seminary when he's 20 something, you know, same type yeah. of deal. Yeah, man. Can, can literally tell you any verse in the Bible at any time. I never grew up in any of that stuff. My, my mom and dad got divorced at, at, um, my like first grade year. And, and then from there, man, like I was raised kind of not on the streets, but I was kind of raised by my brother or by babysitters or by coaches. And, and, and the crazy, one other crazy thing is, is check this out. When I was in the seventh grade, uh, you know, I, I grew up playing football every single year. And when I was going in from, from the seventh grade in my eighth grade year, things got, I guess I, I started hanging around the wrong crowd and I started, you know, going to parties and, and, 
just doing things that obviously I shouldn't be doing. Like you name it, I was probably out there doing it. And, uh, but I didn't have a father figure telling me that I should be doing this stuff. I mean, he was in my life, but he grew up in the seventies. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he was partying himself too. So, you know, he, there wasn't somebody like, like holding me accountable. And I remember going to my seventh grade or eighth grade year and I was going to, it was football. It was football practice that night or that day. And I was at the pool and I, and, and my brother comes out and he says, Hey, Brandon, some, somebody's calling you telling you that the football practice is starting. You're not there. And I said, yeah, I'm not playing this year. And the crazy thing is, is literally 30 minutes later, somebody that, that there was a coach that came out to that pool at our little trailer park that we had and grabbed me and said, get your butt in the car. You know what I mean? Like, like he was like, you're, you're playing football this year. And so he changed my environment away from all the, the bad environment, the environment that was only going to hurt me and hinder me. And he put me into an environment where I could thrive with other people. And the crazy thing is the sports and those friends kept me in line. And, um, you know, and that looking back on it, once I got into the SEAL teams and I started one of my close friends in the SEAL teams was a super big follower. And he was the first one that kind of guided me towards Jesus. Mm. And, um, I'll never forget it. Like it was crazy, man. Like I looked back and I said, there's no way that, that, that just happened by chance. There's no way that like, cause all these friends now that I was hanging out with, some of them are still doing drugs. Some of them are in jail. Some of them it's crazy. And so, and so that was like my first eye opening encounter, even though it took years and years where I was still doing knucklehead stuff. But, um, that was, that was the, the awakening, I guess you could say. And, and my friend brought it to me in a way that wasn't, I think sometimes you go to church, like everybody, there's so much pressure for you to go to church, go to church, go to church. And I like church. The problem is, is with church, a lot of times there's a lot of church, but there, there's, there's not a lot of God. And, you know, I wanted to find something I was on the, I was seeking constantly on trying to find someone that I could relate to that, that like the last church I went to, they had a saying where it was, uh, you know, um, I want to, I want to change you from having corporate encounters with God, the daily personal encounters with God. And so I wanted to have a relationship with my father. And so my mm -hmm. friend taught me, he said, Brandon, stop acting as if it's some religious deity up in the sky and just have a conversation with your father. Like, you don't have to pray a certain prayer. You don't have to sit, sorry, my daughter's in the background. You don't have to say a certain thing. He said, just literally just have a conversation with your father. And, and, and you know, what's funny and I'll leave you with this. You know, I have two girls now and I used to think like, well, you know, I'm not good enough because of all the stuff I've done in the past, like all these different things. And, um, and that was one thing that kept me from having that relationship with my father was that, you know, I, I can't have a relationship with him because I'm not a good person. I've done all these crazy things in the past. And then my friend tells me, he goes, Brandon, you're, you're a father. He goes, let me ask you if you're, if your daughter, if she messes up, let's just say she you're out in the playground and she hits a kid like, or she does something that really disappoints you. Are you going to, are you going to not love her anymore? And I was like, of course I would love her. She's my daughter. He goes, you don't think your father doesn't love you. And I was like, Oh, that's deep. That right there was like an instant change for me. I was that, that, that sparked a light bulb for me where I was like, we, 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 we create something that's not in my mind, that's way more than what it really is when it's really just your father who loves you unconditionally. And like, you can have a relationship with him at any time and you don't have to take the world's view of it. It's just, it's just a conversation with, with your father. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And, and thanks for sharing that. And it's also awesome because most people look at God in the perspective of their father as a good representation. So like, like your daughter that you talked about, is going to have a great, like we're, we're kind of being a representation of Christ to our family. And that's why if you make a decision, like you make a decision to follow Christ, there's a 90% chance, 91% that your whole family will do that as the man. And, and if, if a wife makes a decision, it's like 18% chance because it's really difficult to get in that order. If a woman wants to be healthy, that doesn't mean a man's going to go lose weight or else every household in America would probably be pretty healthy. Women are usually a little bit more on the forefront of like being more rounded in everything family health working together and so just like that decision but you also didn't bring like i'm sure you brought some of that junk into your relationship with god but you're able to look at it also from your perspective of you having kids like 
that that hit me hard with my son when he was born. I'm like, he doesn't do anything for the world. All he does is poop and, and we have to do everything for him. And he gives so much back because like it still fulfills you. You take care of a baby and you're like, you do nothing for me and you give me so much. And I was like, dang, is this what it means, God? Like that, like who we are is important and valuable. And we, we love, like we're loved for who we are and who we've been created to be. And like, it's not based on what we do because like my baby couldn't do anything. And I was like, dang, like, that's crazy. That's a love I never really experienced before. So man, thank you so much for, for sitting here with us. And I would love for, for people to get more connected to what you guys are doing. So if you could share some of the ways, I know we dropped your guys's Instagrams a ton in there, um, but would love for them just to understand how to get more connected. Yeah, man, just message me on Instagram. I'm very connected with everybody on there. When they message me, I get back to them. I'm not, I'm not too big. Like some of these influencers that I think they're so cool out there. You know, like I, I really care about just about people, man, like helping people win. That's why I'm launching the brand called The Journey to Win. So I'll be launching that podcast here within the next 90 days. I'm going to give people just, I'll have you on, obviously. I would love to have you on, um, you know, and it's just good people who are winning in life and not just one pillar because it's cool if you're winning in business. But if your kids hate you, if your wife doesn't like you, if you are have no relationship with your spiritual father, then you're probably not going to be the best role model in other areas. Like cool people can follow you on how to make money, but like how many millionaires kill themselves? Like that's not winning to me. So I want to teach people how to win in every area of their life, how to win in health, how to win in business, how to win in wealth, not looking rich, but creating wealth. You know, so many people are trying to impress people like going broke, trying to look rich, like the saying goes. And, you know, it's like, why, why do you need some of these stuff that you, that you, that you think you need? You don't, you're just trying to impress people online or, or in your circle, you know, it's like, I think the last statistic I read was 37% of people's income is getting paid on their mortgage or their rent. And it's like, why? That's just, it's because you're trying to keep up with the Joneses and that's only going to leave you broken, broken. And so I want to help people win in their finances and their marriages and their business. And then just in life, help them grow because when they grow, everything grows. And so and that's my goal. I should have it up and running prior within the next 90 days. It's going to, going to be called the journey to win. And, um, you know, I have to go out and interview everybody between now and then it's going to be a lot of fun. So I'm excited about it. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it because you are an example of it, right? From, from your background, Navy SEALs, not a, no joke, man. Talk about like wanting to achieve something like that is not something that's small marriage finances, now family two under two congrats. That's really cool. Obviously fitness. You can't, you can't be not taking care of your health before or after with the stuff that you've had to do. So I think it's cool because you're doing it at a very high level, which gives people a lot of confidence in what you say. And I, I think last thing I will uh, we'll say is that there's a time when God, when who God promotes, no one can demote, right? And a lot of people try to enter the season of promotion where they, they can get a lot of followers, let's say. Like my son, he'll have a lot of followers here soon. He's cute. He's talented. They'll get a lot of recognition for doing very little. And it's easy to get caught up in that. And, and when I look at like who God anoints, like all of a sudden there's a time where you get anointed for something. And it's like when all of a sudden what you do starts hitting people. And a lot of that comes with expertise, right? If you were to talk about launch this show and you didn't become a Navy SEAL, you didn't have the finances and the business that you guys run, the influence that you and your wife have, the marriage that you guys have, the two kids, and then also the promotion of God that's built inside of that with the anointing, which makes everything you do more powerful, that's what's going to make it blow up. And all of those things together are what make it super powerful. So it's not just the, the normal stuff because you also got God's anointing, which is, that's the, that's the multiplier, man. So I'm looking forward to seeing it and thank you for sharing it with us. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. You know, I, you know, obviously you're right in line with everything that, that, I would like to have on our podcast. So, you know, you're, you're winning in your marriage, you're winning as a father, you're winning in business, you're winning in mentoring other people. You're not just making life about you. You're making it about helping others. So like, that's to me, you know, Tony Robbins said life is about growing and giving, like you're continuing to grow, but you're also helping other people grow and you're giving back at a very high level, both financially and through knowledge, education, spiritually, all that stuff, man. So thank, thank you for being the example of, of, of what people should be doing, you know? Yeah. And if everyone wants to see me go rip it open on your podcast, then, then go listen to that episode where I, I'm going to be, I'm going to be going hard. We'll, we'll have some fun. So thank you so much yeah. again, man. And uh, we'll have to do another one.